Well, it's pretty clear after last night that Georgia has supplanted Alabama as the best program in college football. And I think that there's one team in the SEC East that has set up the best to take on that challenge. Our Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Lyon, and as always, thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen here today. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. And, uh, What a snooze fest of a national title game that took place last night between Georgia and TCU. Um, No question that Georgia was by far the best team. They absolutely dominated the hypnotoads, as they called themselves in 2022. And um, I say snooze fest to describe the national title game because besides the score, for me personally, uh, this was the first national title game in a long time that I actually slept through the majority of. Uh, I fell asleep like sometime early on in the first quarter. And by the time I woke up again, it was like 35 or 48 to 7 uh, Georgia. So, yeah, apparently you could have pretty much been better off probably doing something else last night. You would have missed anything. Um, Georgia, again, was by far the best team in college football this year. So one final congratulations to them. But in terms of now looking ahead and looking at which teams can challenge the Georgia Bulldogs, when looking at the SEC East, I think the South Carolina Gamecocks are set up the best to challenge the Bulldogs, not just in 2023, but also beyond. And there's a few reasons why I think this. In terms of coaches, you look, of course, at Kirby Smart. He is the best coach, period, in the SEC East. But behind Kirby Smart is a group of coaches that have only been in the league for, you know, one, two, three, four years now. And you're looking at coaches like Josh Heupel, like Shane Beamer, like Billy Napier, Eli Drinkwitz, Clark Lee, and Mark Stoops, who obviously is the longest tenured coach in the SEC East. And when looking at all of these coaches, there's one coach that can challenge Kirby Smart in a football game in my eyes and that is Shane Beamer and here's the thing I know that a lot of other fans would sit there and think that all Shane Beamer does is just motivate and basically just be a rah-rah guy on the sidelines for his guys during a football game but that's not a proper sentence to encapsulate everything that is coach Shane Beamer Shane Beamer is a coach that can be quite methodical behind the scenes especially. He's a guy that is very methodical in terms of both the players and coaches he brings in to his program. So, in terms of a culture, Shane Beamer's already set that. You don't really have a culture yet at Florida. Billy Napier, of course, is still trying to build that. You don't really have a quote-unquote culture, so to speak, at Tennessee. Their culture is just, well, we got a high-flying offense. Come and join us. Kentucky... I would say they have a culture, but they might have more so of a climate after what we saw happen to the Wildcats this past year. Missouri, I don't think there's really a definitive culture that is nationally viewed that you could describe over in Columbia, Missouri. Vanderbilt, it's Vanderbilt. So basically, when you look at all these coaches, Shane Beamer has got what Kirby Smart has developed, which is a culture that took years and years to build and plant seeds for. At the same time, Coach Beamer knows Kirby Smart better than any other coach in this division. You know why? Because Shane Beamer coached under Kirby Smart. He's been in that building. He has seen the way that Kirby Smart leads his program. So he knows the kind of coach he is facing year in and year out. And obviously, that's not going to make it a guarantee that you're going to win every single game against said coach. But it's a lot better to have firsthand knowledge of how a guy like that's going to operate 
than to be someone who from the outside looking in, like maybe uh, Eli Drinkwitz or even a Josh Heupel, they've never coached under Kirby Smart. They've never been on the same staff, as far as I remember, as Kirby Smart. So that's one reason why South Carolina is built to challenge Georgia. Another reason why they're built to challenge Georgia. South Carolina, better than any other team right now in this division, maybe besides Georgia, is doing what they need to do in terms of their roster composition to be able to go against Georgia for 60 minutes. And that is build their roster from the inside out. It's been talked about before on this show with our resident recruiting insider of Locked On, John Garcia Jr., the Gamecocks have obviously signed some really solid defensive linemen and offensive linemen in the 2023 recruiting class. Guess what? You look at the 2024 recruiting class, it looks like it's set up to happen once again. You have targets like Cam Pringle and Josiah Thompson on the offensive line. You got guys on the defensive line like Dylan Stewart, like a Justin Green, like a Heaven Brown Schuler, And you got plenty of other guys as well that I'm not mentioning right here right now. South Carolina's coaching staff understands that if they're going to be able to challenge Georgia for the foreseeable future, they have to start with the trenches. If they cannot even match them in the trenches, they're not going to have a chance to knock them off. But South Carolina understands that, and they're in the process currently of overhauling those positions, of making it to where not just the first string, but the second string and third string could all start, could all play significant snaps if they really wanted to. So that's another reason why South Carolina is set up to challenge the Georgia Bulldogs over the foreseeable future. The other thing is this. South Carolina admittedly is going to benefit from the fact that when people think of, okay, who could challenge Georgia? Nationally speaking, South Carolina probably won't be the first team that gets brought up. It probably just won't. And it's because they don't have a high-flying offense like Tennessee. They don't have the history that Florida has. And so when you counter in both of those facts, and of course you also counter what Tennessee has done, even though it seems like light years ago when they were a team that, you know, could really win national championships, at least for my generation, then... um. Analysts and pundits, they're going to immediately look at Tennessee and Florida. They're not going to mention South Carolina first. That's just a fact. They're, they're not going to do that. And the thing is, South Carolina fans should not get down the dumps when that happens because that's just the way the media likes to work. The media at times, quite honestly, can be quite lazy in terms of research and narrative. It's a lot easier to insert a program that has won championships before, like Florida, Tennessee, than it is to step out on a limb and say, you know something, I think South Carolina actually is setting up to be the best threat, the biggest threat to Georgia for this division in the next few years. That's going to help South Carolina. So when they officially get to that point where it's like, hey, they can't just match up with Georgia. They could beat Georgia on any given year, which they are rapidly getting closer to that point. I'm not going to make it out like they're right there. They still got a ways to go. But once they get to that point, it's going to be almost a shell shock for everyone else in college football. Maybe not for Kirby Smart. I'm not going to sit here and say that Kirby Smart's going to overlook South Carolina. But for the rest of the country, you know, they'll be catching up to what South Carolina fans and maybe even Georgia's coaching staff have known for a couple years when this whole thing does take place is that South Carolina has been building for this for years. We haven't been paying them enough attention, and now it's time that they get some attention. South Carolina, they are the team that can challenge these Bulldogs in the SEC East as the Bulldogs have taken the mantle now as the best team in college football. I think Shane Beamer and his coaching staff and this team secretly, they're going to enjoy that challenge, every single bit of it, over the next decade and a half or so and of course if you're going to challenge teams like the Georgia Bulldogs you got to have really good players it doesn't matter how good the coaching staff is you got to have a roster full of studs and South Carolina is going to get one back in 2023 in Antoine Juice Wells what does that mean for this offense what does that mean for the team overall what does it maybe mean for Spencer Rattler and a decision that he still hasn't announced yet. We're going to dive into all of that in just a couple of moments right here on Locked on Gamecocks. 
Today's show is brought to you by Built Bar. Now, if you're looking for a delicious treat, but maybe you don't want all the fat content and the high levels of calories that can be included with these protein bars, then you have got to try Built Bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that can help you accomplish your New Year's resolutions this time around. They aren't just healthy. They're extremely enjoyable and tasty. They're covered in 100% real chocolate, something that's not a guarantee with every protein bar that you can get out there. They've also got flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, and much, much more. These bars are only 130 calories. They include just 4 grams of sugar and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now, you can get these bars at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. If you go to Walmart, go to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a 4-bar box that includes cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. At Sam's Club, you can grab a 13-bar box that includes brownie batter and churro. I promise you, you'll thank me later because Built Bar is where tasty is the new healthy. Welcome back to this Tuesday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. I want to thank y'all for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where you'll find everything you need to know about college basketball in just one place. Plus, you'll hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. He's back. Antoine Juice Wells officially announced on Monday evening, right before the national championship game took place, that he is returning to Columbia for the 2023 season. Now, there's really truthfully only one surprise to me with this entire decision and announcement that Antoine Juice Wells has made. This entire time, I've been basically working under the premise that Antoine Juice Wells is clearly probably basing his decision off what Spencer Rattler is going to do. And because of that, I figured that if anyone was going to announce their decision first, it was going to be Spencer Rattler. And then subsequently, Antoine Juice Wells was going to announce the same thing after him, whether it was going to be going to the NFL or coming back to South Carolina for another season. And as it turned out, Juice Wells ended up being the first one. So... Obviously, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say here that Antoine Juice Wells coming back to South Carolina is huge for Shane Beamer and this coaching staff. Why is that the case? There's a couple of reasons for that. In the wide receiver room, talked about this before, Jalen Brooks and Josh Van are both gone from this team. And obviously, you know, neither of these guys maybe possesses the talent that Antoine Juice Wells brings to the football field. But here's the thing. As Kirby Smart, even of Georgia, mentioned multiple times last night, it's not easy to just replace guys that have been very productive for you and your program over the course of several years. Jalen Brooks and Josh Van were a couple of guys at wide receiver that were really, really effective for this offense. They were really a big cog of this offense. Josh Van, obviously, in 2021, was the best receiver on the team, statistically speaking. Again, 2022 did not have the year that he probably envisioned. None of the fans probably envisioned him having the year that he had. But Josh Van still came on late in the season. Obviously had that big game against the Tennessee Volunteers and showed glimpses again of what he can do at wide receiver and why he is a weapon there. He's not just a guy that's just a possession receiver, someone that, you know, is just maybe a burner who could take the top off a of defense. Josh Van could do a little bit of everything. And honestly, you could say the same thing about Jalen Brooks. These guys were just flat-out football players. These guys, there was not a single thing that maybe they couldn't do. And maybe there wasn't anything that they necessarily excelled at, but they did everything at a above-average level at the wide receiver spot. And having wide receivers like that on your football team is extremely important. It's just as important as having those guys that can score on any given play, guys that can literally jump out of the stadium and get a football over a cornerback. Those kind of players are just as important. South Carolina's losing those guys. If South Carolina were to turn around and lose Juice Wells 
on top of that, that would have been a staggering loss for this wide receiver room. A wide receiver room that is already going to have to rely on guys like to carry on Joyner a lot more next year, like Amarian Brown, like an Omega Blake, like an Landon Sampson. This wide receiver room in 2023, now not completely, but still, they're going to have to find some new players at this spot who can step up and help out. And the thing is, with Amari Brown to carry on Joyner, both of these guys are coming back for one final year. Unless they get hurt and they can apply for a medical waiver to return, which obviously no one ever hopes that that's what's going to happen, um, the, both of those guys are going to be gone after this next season. So you need to have some guys step up. And if Antoine Wells would have left on top of that, then South Carolina would have found themselves in a real dire situation in that regard. Antoine Juice Wells coming back offsets the losses of Josh Van and Jalen Brooks to a significant degree. It's a number one target for whoever's going to be playing quarterback at South Carolina in 2023. Juice Wells is, again, kind of like Jalen Brooks and Josh Van, kind of like I just described those guys. He does everything well. There's not one tool in his toolbox in particular that's just above and beyond every other tool in the toolbox. Every single tool in Juice Wells' toolbox is is extremely efficient, it's durable, and it's going to get the job done. That's the way he is as a wide receiver. The difference is, in big games, you saw this guy step up time and time again. Arkansas, Tennessee, Clemson, three of the bigger games in the season this past year. Juice Wells went for well over 100 yards and a couple of TDs in each of those contests. You want to see that out of your number one wide receiver. Juice Wells brings that. He now has a year of big-time experience in the SEC. So whoever plays quarterback for South Carolina, they're going to be able to sleep a little bit easier at night knowing that they're going to have number three out wide for them at that wide receiver position. So cannot express enough just how big of a deal it is for Juice Wells to come back. And also, it tells you about this program that Shane Beaver continues to build and his coaching staff continues to build. Because again, we kind of talked about this with the guys that left the team in the last month and a half or so. Guys like Jaheim Bell, guys like Marshawn Lloyd, Gilbert Edmond, and others. Obviously, some players may be leaving the season. We expected to probably bounce. But some other guys, you know, we did not expect to leave. And it brought up questions as to, is there something legitimately bad going on within the building there at South Carolina? This is a reason to believe that that is clearly not the case. Because the thing is, if South Carolina had some real toxicity developing within that building right now that was shooing players off, then Antoine Wells would have probably already decided that he was going to head on to the NFL and just take his chance. The fact that Antoine Wells is coming back for another year tells you that he believes in this coaching staff and he thinks that they can make him even better and help him propel his draft stock even more before he heads on to the men's league, as Pat McAfee likes to put it. So, again, short and sweet, cannot express with enough words just how much this return means for South Carolina. And obviously, we'll continue to monitor what the situation is with Spencer Rattler, as he only has, at this point, six days now to make his final decision on whether or not he's going to come back, as January 16th is the deadline for underclassmen who are eligible for the NFL to officially declare for the draft and sign with an agent. So we'll see what all happens in that regard moving forward. But I have to imagine that Juice Wells coming back is a really good indication of where that possible situation is heading. All right, to finish off today's show, let's talk about a really intriguing entry into the transfer portal in Missouri defensive end Trajan Jeffcoat. Now, a few of y'all might be sitting there and you might be wondering, Andrew, why are you talking about a Missouri defensive end? Why are you talking about this guy entering the portal? But the thing is, I know in this certain situation, there's only a handful of y'all that are probably sitting there thinking that right now. The majority of you, assuming that you're all obviously diehard South Carolina fans, probably know why I'm bringing up Trajan Jeffcoat. Because this is a guy that is literally from right down the road in Irmo, South Carolina. Played at Irmo High School back in the 2017 season and was a part of the 2018 recruiting class. And, of course, has been at Missouri for the last four or five years. 
Trajan Jeffcoat is a kid that, of course, came up when Will Muschamp and his coaching staff was here in Columbia. And this was one of those cases where South Carolina did not offer him when he was coming out of high school. And there was a lot of backlash from some of the fans that could not understand why Trajan Jeffcoat did not get an offer from Will Muschamp and the staff. Because the thing is, Jeff Coat was somebody who had put up a really strong senior campaign at Irma High School. In his senior season there, he had 13 sacks, 23 quarterback hurries, and participated in South Carolina's Shrine Bowl, or at least the Shrine Bowl between the best senior prospects in South Carolina and North Carolina. Despite all of that, he only got two Power 5 offers, one from Indiana and another one from Missouri. So he wound up going on to play for the Tigers in the SEC, and needless to say, I think that Trajan Jeffcoat has well outplayed, um, I guess, the quote-unquote rankings that he had coming out of high school because Jeffcoat has been a very productive defensive end and edge defender for Missouri for the last few seasons. He's obviously put up some solid numbers in terms of sacks and tackles for loss. In the 2020 COVID season, he was a first-team All-SEC selection. So this guy can clearly play. This guy can ball. And he has entered the transfer portal now as a graduate transfer. And I have to imagine, with South Carolina having the current depth situation they have right now at that edge position, and Trejan Jeffco being a South Carolina native, having grown up and played not too far away from Columbia and williams Bryce Stadium for that matter, I'm going to go ahead and say that South Carolina is probably going to pursue this one heavily here. Now, I've not seen any official news yet that South Carolina has dispensed an offer to Trajan Jeffcoat, if that actually has not happened yet, uh, I would imagine it won't be too much longer before you'll hear something regarding this. Let's just say this. There's not going to be some big old paper trail that you've got to follow here. There's not going to be a whole lot of breadcrumbs that you're going to have to eat before you reach your conclusion. This guy would fill in a massive need here for South Carolina, a team that obviously has lost Gilbert Edmond and Jordan Birch and Hot Rod Finn, for that matter, to the transfer per to the transfer portal. Obviously, the guys that they have left, there's not really a whole lot of proven production at the Power 5 level there at that spot, with the exception of Terrell Dawkins, who had an injury plague 2022 season, did not play very many snaps here in Clayton White's defense this past year. And yes, they're bringing in guys like Montague Rames and Desmond Umeo Zulu, who I think both guys are going to be really, really, really solid players there. But the thing is, again, these guys are going to be true freshmen in 2023. It would not be completely fair in either case to expect both of these guys to just come right on in and immediately start for this team. As I mentioned before, and I'll keep it short and sweet again, it's really hard for freshman linemen to be able to come into college football, and especially the SEC conference, and be able to be physically and mentally equipped to handle those responsibilities right away from the get-go. Trajan Jeffcoat would offset some of these losses in a big way. Now, of course, some people have gone ahead and said that they think that Trajan Jeffcoat coming here to South Carolina means that we would not miss Jordan Birch at all. I'm not going to go that far and say that, but what I will say is this. Trajan Jeffcoat is a guy that is going to bring a pass-rushing burst off the line of scrimmage. He's a guy that certainly has an explosive quick twitch off the line of scrimmage. And he's also, of course, got some experience in the SEC, which, I mean, my gosh, what else could you ask for in that regard? He's not some guy that's going to be coming from Group of Five or, you know, the FCS level is going to be coming into South Carolina. And the first few weeks, he's going to have to adjust to these SEC athletes, and he's going to be like, whoa. Okay, I was not completely prepared to go up against this kind of player. You're not going to have that issue with Trajan Jeffcoat. So my point with bringing him up is to basically say, Gamecock fans, take this one and put it away in your mental filing cabinet for now regarding some transfer portal targets for South Carolina moving forward. Because again, it hasn't been officially announced yet, but I'm going to go ahead and heavily assume here that South Carolina is going to go after Trajan Jeffcoat. And I think that if South Carolina is very interested in getting Jeffcoat and bringing him on board here, I don't think it will necessarily take long for Trajan Jeffcoat to make his final decision here at the end of this process. So Trajan Jeffcoat is definitely going to be one to watch over the coming days and maybe coming week. 
Uh, South Carolina also has a really big time recruiting target in Cam Pringle, who announced yesterday that he's officially committing on January the 22nd. That is only 12 days from today. That is on a Sunday. And if you ask me right now, Andrew, who do you think has the best chance to land him? I would say South Carolina. I think South Carolina right now should feel real confident with where they currently stand with Cam Pringle, obviously. Very soon we'll have John Garcia Jr. come on the show, and I'll ask him more specifically where he thinks the Gamecocks stand. But I see no reason to believe that Cam Pringle is going to go elsewhere. I do think that Clemson has put up a really big fight here in this recruitment. I think that Georgia obviously has made a big push here as well. North Carolina has caught his interest some. Ohio State has thrown their hat in the ring. But at the end of the day, I think South Carolina's got a lot going for them right now. I think it really paid dividends for them that they did as well as they did in 2022, ending all the streaks that they did, winning those games at the very end of the season like they did. And I think that that's going to play a big role into Cam Pringle's final decision here on January 22nd. So keep your eyes posted on that recruiting battle as well. But with that being said, that's going to do it for today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What are your thoughts on South Carolina's prospects to challenge Georgia in the SEC East, not just in 2023, but for years to come? What are your thoughts on the news that Antoine Juice Wells is going to be returning to South Carolina? And what do you think about Trajan Jeffcoat entering the transfer portal and the chance that South Carolina both pursues and lands him? Let me know all your thoughts down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube. Or you can shoot me a direct message at a line underscore SC on Twitter. And I'll try to respond to your message as quickly as I see it. And once again, don't forget to make Locked On College Basketball your second listen or watch now that you have listened to or watched the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. But again, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. I hope that y'all have a great rest of your Tuesday, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. <laughs>